What a great city. Kim said, she leaned over and she said, they really do care about our military children. Mm -hmm. And so from that, we just, Kim and I, and uh, the chief and Alice want to thank you for that. That's so important. We talk about mission airmen families, and families are so important because, you know, we recruit, we recruit airmen, we retain families. And thank you for doing that. It's a great city, and it's got a great spirit to it, so it's really cool being here with you. Some in the room were with us last night when we were, uh, our city was given the Altus Cup for what our city does to support Goodfellow, actually a partnership with Goodfellow. And they, the, the Kim Jose and some of her other staff, and that's why we're so grateful for you guys coming uh, or had a, something they couldn't get out of, even with a little clout. But I was given a battlefield promotion last night. So I'm going to wear this, General, <laughs> since you gave it to me last night. I just want to make sure that the lights uh, hit it right. I love it. I love uh, it. When I saw uh, General Rand a few, a couple of three weeks ago, um, he gave me this book written by his chief Master Sergeant that he had worked, was your partner for three years, two in Arizona, and then one in the heat, in the hottest year, if that's possible to say, a battle in uh, Af uh, Iraq. Right. And um, General Rand, is a, as I said, is a fighter pilot, and so he was in harm's way every single day. And this book, you, uh, not edited, well edited about the content from his diary, but Chief Deerduff, we discussed at dinner last night and um, I loaned it and Charlie Powell brought it back to me this morning and you all know I loan my books. I just leave me a sticky note who has it so I can come after you. But what not only did I learn about that year when uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it was, uh, I'm just going to call it hell. Um, he also captured the leadership qualities of Joran. And his, I'm really going to ask you a question. There's a question coming. Okay. Um, he, everywhere that I know from here, Iraq, to, uh, yes, to this assignment at he was purposefully put at um, over Joint Base San, well over AETC, uh, because and there, if you well know, because we keep up with the news here, um, a lot of things were happening there about sexual assaults, and he initiated and was unveiled over the last few weeks the process that he has researched and his team have researched to put into place that all the way up people are going to be reminded every constantly about making good choices and professionalism. And then he did that so well as many of you know when you do something really well we give you other opportunities. And now in a few weeks uh, they are going uh, to the next hot uh, need um, besides overseas, and that is to make the situation of the morale and the cheating at, with the nukes. And so he will be changing to the uh, Global Strike Major Command. And I'm not happy, but I understand, told, and I've told both of you, I knew when General Welch knew I wasn't going to be happy to, to lose him early. We deserved you two years. Right. And so, but I understood why. There, were only, there was only one other that I felt like could have gone because their spirits, they feel low about themselves, don't they, sir? A little bit. Yes, sir. And you're going to go share your love. Okay, now. Um, what leadership qualities are critical for someone to pass, possess? Okay. Well, this is unscripted, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I, if, when you said comments, I would like to thank you for your leadership. 
So it's a little uncomfortable because I'm in a room full of leaders. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're doing is unbelievable. Kim and I have three grandchildren, 10 and a half, seven and a half, and four. Thanks. They're our future. These mm -hmm. fine young men and women here in front of us are our future. And so I admire what you do. Um, let me just say about that question, I think leadership can be taught. So that's one thing I've come to adopt in my life. There are natural leaders. There are people who have wonderful skills. They're charismatic. They dance well on the dance floor. They can run the 100-yard dash really fast. They're gifted. You know, they can speak well. Those are God-given gifts, I think, to some degree. But leadership can be taught. And it comes in all sizes and shapes and packages. But there has to be some traits that good leaders have. And you can develop those traits. And so I'm often asked, if I were to pass on, what would that be? I would say the first thing to be a good leader is you have to know your mission. What's your mission? What's your mission? And then you have to articulate that mission to the people that you're leading. they got to know your mission. That's key. Know your mission, articulate your mission. Number two, I think a good leader has to be an effective role model. You have to try to live by what you're asking others to do. I think that goes without saying. Not rocket science, is it? None of this is, is overcomplicated. I think a good leader needs to make sure that they don't walk past the problem without trying to fix it. A lot of times people just kind of will look the other way, ignore it, hope it goes away. Take it on. Identify it. If you can fix it, fix it. If it's beyond your capability, at least identify it and let someone know who can fix it go about doing that. I think that's important. To me, a good leader is someone who's humble. Humble, with the chaplain in the room, I think is a term people confuse with being meek and mild. I don't think that's humility at all. Be whoever you are. If you're outgoing, be outgoing. If you're meek and mild, be meek and mild. But humility is deflecting credit to others when things go well. But more important than that is accepting re responsibility when things are broke. A leader has to take responsibility. And then I think a leader has to be approachable. People got to be able to come up to you. They say there's no such thing as a you know, a dumb question, right? There's no dumb question. Well, there are dumb questions. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. If you're asked that dumb question, how do you make people feel about it? Do you make them feel dumb when they ask that? I think that ability to people to approach you. You might say to them, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll look it up with you. Let's go find the answer together. <laughs> or, hey, here's your homework assignment. Tonight, go on internet. I want you to Google X, Y, and Z. And come back tomorrow and tell me what you learned. That's what an approachable leader will do instead of saying, go away. That's the dumbest question I've ever heard. We can go on and on. There's a couple others. A leader needs to be able to say three words. Not very often, but when appropriate. I am sorry. I am sorry. I think that's important. And then I guess the last trait I think of a leader is you have to have balance. You know, you don't want to be full scale left or right on your emotions. But I think people need to see that you can laugh. And occasionally people maybe can see that you can cry. Be able to show a reality to folks. Those would be some of the things that I would submit to people if you want to improve your leadership skills, all those you can work at. My wife would add to that. She'd say a good leader needs to be a better listener. I'm not a good listener, so obviously I have a lot of room for improvement. We could go on and on, but I think those are some of the things. The, the reason this is in interesting, there have been books written on leadership. You know, we could talk for this entire day, all week, into next week and through the month about leadership, couldn't we? Mm -hmm. So how do you scale it right down? I would submit to, I guess, the young guys and gals here, pick about five or six traits and work on those. And then over time, you can add to that. Did I answer your question? 
That was pretty good. <laughs> okay, who has had in your life the greatest impact as far as your leadership? And yeah. Well, <laughs> I think you have to have your foundation. You know, you get your foundation built on a lot of things. A lot of us get it through our family. A lot of us get it through faith. Uh, in my f case, faith came a little later in my life. So it started with my, my dad. Um, but I certainly it, am a very flawed person, but I certainly personally, uh, you know, am a believer in the good Lord, and, and I think he was a pretty good example for us to follow. So I'd have to say that. Um, my wife is has a big impact on me because she's the one person that keeps me rooted and grounded, I think, and, and, and lets me know, kindly, by the way, but lets me know what some of my tragic flaws are. <laughs> um, I, I mentioned my dad. My dad was a good guy. And so, but so 36 years in this business, I, I got to tell you, you take from everyone. You take from everyone. You even take from those that you don't want to emulate. Okay? And that'll be a pretty good reminder. I don't want to be that dude. And not pointing at Chief Good. I'd like to be that dude. I'm glad you clarified that. So I think you take from a lot of people. But um, I've, it, the good Lord Jesus and my dad probably had the, for me personally. Can't get better than that. I, I wish you all could meet my dad. He was quite a guy. He was something. He was a fought in two wars, was shot down when he was 21 years old in World War II. Um, 20 years later, he was shot down again in Vietnam. I told that story on Veterans Day one time. And I was bragging about him. After he'd come up to me, he said, son, I wish you'd stop telling that story. And I go, why, Dad? He goes, there's nothing to be proud about getting shot down twice. <laughs> it just means you weren't very good in those two days. <laughs> this is a, um, you're, you and I are rounding the last curve of our uh, professional career in these positions. Um, you have a little longer than I. What do you hope you will be remembered as your legacy? And that's a big word, legacy. I've already talked about and told them about your a, a process that is incredible uh, that he's implemented down in, at uh, Randolph <coughs> and uh, Lackland. But what else? Well, gee whiz, Carol Ann, that's a good, tough question, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I don't give it much thought about legacy building. I really don't. I just think you work hard. And a young man asked me today at breakfast, you know, what's your key to success? And I go, well, let's define success first of all. I mean, define it for me. Mm -hmm. Am I successful because I have four stars? To some, I guess, they would say that's successful in the Air Force. Um, others would debate that. But I said if we're going to define success, just be really good at your job and live by your core values. For us, that's integrity and uh, first and service before self and excellence in all we do. I think if you live by that, you'll be successful and, and you'll have a legacy that will follow. Um, I don't care about my legacy. I, I guess um, I've given it some thought. What would I want people to remember me by? I would want on my tombstone if, if I could write. So, honey, write this down. <laughs> about three simple things I would want he's a good wingman because to us that's everything you know when someone says to you you know I want you on my wing that's the ultimate compliment because that means you'll check each other six so I'd like to be known as a good wingman professionally I'd like that uh, as I get a little older I wish I could undo some of the mistakes I've made, but I certainly want to hopefully be remembered as being a good husband, and I'd like to be known as a good father. That's pretty good. Good, 
good grandfather, right? There you go. Besides, in all of we actually were hit with, we didn't call it sequestration in the school business, but we, got, we had to reduce, we reduced, Jeff, 12 million or so, uh, three or four, yes, good, yes, ma'am. Now, I've known it since the stars. Um, and so it was. I built a monster, didn't I, man? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Um, we, it was the hardest, most painful thing to let a hundred plus people go who had done nothing wrong. Right. Uh, buying fewer supplies, uh, we adjusted. But what, besides the reduction in money, has been your big, some of your biggest challenges of leadership? Recently or, for, you know, across I'm the spectrum? I'm turning you loose. Wow. Well, certainly the last couple years has been somewhat challenging for, for us. Uh, sequestration has had an impact on us. So don't believe what, what you might be hearing that it, hadn't, it has had a big impact, particularly in our readiness. So as, a, as the commander of Air Education Training Command, a big challenge is to make sure that we can recruit, train, and educate airmen, okay, to deliver air power. And we have to do that more efficiently. So my biggest challenge is to figure out how we can do this as effectively as we've done it in the past, but we got to be more efficient. And I say we have to have kind of new business rules. Uh, we have to have a new status quo. But I'm not smart enough yet to know what that status quo is, so we're still figuring that out as we go along. And that's what the challenge has been is what has to change? How do we get more innovative? How do we get more efficient? And, and we're working through that, I think, the, the, the guys up in the front row. One of the things I know is we got to get up, though, from below our level. They're the smart people. They'll tell you how to be more innovative. So I think tapping in to the, uh, to the younger generation and learning from them and listening to them and figuring out how we're going to deal with the next 5, 10, 15 years as we shape and develop in this physically constrained environment that isn't going to go away anytime soon. That's obviously been a, been a, a challenge here recently, you know. Um, but geez, through the course of my career, you know, you have your ups and downs. I mean, challenges, you know, galore. Uh, but I, I worked for a guy named Al, with a guy named uh, Major General Al Flowers. When he retired, he was the longest serving Airman in the history of the Air Force. He was in for over 47 years, folks. And we used to brief the Secretary of the Air Force every morning. We were two, at the time, we were major generals together. And Al was in charge of the Air Force budget, finance, FMB it was called. And the Secretary would ask him questions like, hey, has this got passed? What's Congress done here? And Al would look at him and say, Mr. Secretary, the sky isn't falling, mm. but if it is, we'll catch it. Mm. And I always would get such hope from that. And then I've taken it one step further. I, the sky isn't falling, but if it is, we'll catch it. Because what choice do we have? If we let the sky hit, and what we do for a business, that's just not acceptable. So we got to catch it. So don't look at it as challenges. You know, well, what opportunities. We, oh, opportunities. Opportunities. Okay. And it was either when we were down there, one of your staff briefed us, or when uh, we were in D.C., that a year, a year and a half or so ago, and I'm, I'm, I'm an ish, they know, for, there were four-ish hot spots in the world, and this last year, mm -hmm. ten, with less money. So um, I just, to let, we have, we don't have bombs dropping on us, but we do have stressed families and bombs being brought to school, weapons, uh, and stressed families. So we all live in it, and so we have opportunities, don't we? Yep, we do. Okay. Do you have problem solving steps? You're, you're not a... 
Uh, you don't live your life in command, shoot from the hip. Try not to, but I, I problem solving steps. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I do. So I'll go uh, macro first. <coughs> you try to prevent problems from happening. So that would be be preventative, first of all. So here's how I think you should do that. You have to have a strategic plan. Okay, fancy word, isn't it? So when you go into an organization, you have to have a mission statement. What is our mission? And followed up by what's the vision? What is our vision? And then you have to have objectives. How are we going to accomplish the mission? What are the three to five objectives? And then you have to have how do we get those objectives done? They're called priorities. And I would caution everyone, too many priorities mm -hmm. is dangerous. Mm -hmm. If everything's a priority, what? Nothing's a priority. So in AETC, we have five priorities, mission, airmen, families, rooted and grounded in our core values and inspired by our heritage. So those are the five things that, that we talk. And everyone can find themselves in those five priorities, believe it or not. But then you have to have metrics. You have to measure, be able to measure how you're doing. And metrics have to matter. Metrics drive behavior. And behavior will drive your culture. Make sure you're driving the right metrics. To me, that's problem solving. And if you line that out, then you can come back and very almost systematically look at how you're doing at any point in time. And then you can focus where your attention needs to be. Well, we all know, though, that the unanticipated 20 people are injured mm -hmm. in, a, in a bus accident isn't something that fits into that strategic plan, is it? Mm -hmm. and, and so that's where you just, those skills that we talked about, about leadership. You know, how do you handle adversity? Um, you know, prayer, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. one good way, for sure. But I think with problem solving, uh, there's some smart people that are surrounded with you. Get your folks together. <clears throat> figure out what is the problem. Not a symptom. What's the problem? What's the root cause of the problem? And go after that. We oftentimes go after what? Symptoms. Mm -hmm. You've got to get rid of the Band-Aid, and you've got to figure out what the root cause is. Once you've determined that, then start lining up how you're going to address it. And you got great people around you. And that's what we do. I'm pretty con insistent that we get to the problem. And you know how you get to it? You gotta ask about five questions. You gotta ask what? What's the issue? Why? How do we get there? And you gotta really dig down. And once you get to the problem, it makes things so much easier to address it. Fair enough? I, I think that that's been successful in the times that that I've, you know, had to get after it. Uh, Chief, do you mind coming up here, uh, even though I'll, sh Jack, do I need to share? Uh, oh, Chief, I'm going to give you this mic. We're taping for our TV, and uh, so those of who, who couldn't be here today will have a chance. Okay, now, we're going to keep him honest here, sir. Um, you all have worked together yes, for how long? Well, we started in 2011 at Davis Mountain Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona. Okay. And About he, a week apart. Right, boss? He made it very <clears throat> clear to us last night and is man enough to say he loves you. I know that. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want, how, in your opinion, does he get people to follow him? I, I, I tell him, I want it, to know a little bit more the the individual that he replaced, I talked a little bit about him uh, yesterday. It was an individual by the name of uh, General Rice, and I mentioned to a lot of people because General Rice is a is a a bit of an introvert. And I, and I mentioned to him, I said, I think the, of all the people that I've ever met in my entire life, General Rice is probably one of the smartest. Uh, he, I don't think that there isn't anything that he did not academically. Uh, win number one and I mean from all the way from school to so but again very very introvert and he 
tackled a, 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 a problem a certain way. And I said, but of all the leaders that I've ever been um, around, I said, I have never seen anybody the way that uh, General Rand touches people here and here. You know, the, the, the chief is really good about talking about the distance between, sometimes it's 15, 15 inches from here to here, and sometimes it's a more than a mile, mm -hmm. right? I said, and, and uh, the thing that makes this man very, very special is that he ha also has a, a mind for business, but has a heart for airmen. And that is, uh, that's a special thing when those things come together, and that's the reason that he is so incredibly effective that, that his people skills are something that, uh, that are extraordinary. He has the capacity when, and I've seen it, him do this many, many times, when he meets just you know, regular airmen, and I tell people all the time, there's nobody in our organization that is insignificant. It doesn't matter if you're a one-striper or two-striper, and I tell this all the time, I said, have you ever tried to sleep in a room with a mosquito? You can't do it. I said, there's nobody that's insignificant in our organization. And I said, and he comes across people that are very, very junior in grade, and he asks them a lot of uh, you know, very personal questions, and he won't see them for a very, very long time. And, it's, uh, and uh, many of them have, have approached me later on and said, it's amazing that I, have, you know, I met him once, and he asked me about how my daughter's recital had been, how that turned out, or my, my son's soccer tournament and stuff, because he has the cap that You can't fake that. That's, a, that's something that you, it's got to be genuine. But you can learn that skill, a leadership skill, can't you? Can. That good. When you care about people, you can. Yes, sir. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to embarrass you, but if I do, give me a <laughs> <laughs> She's a general, remember? That's right. Yeah. Okay, last night, he, uh, Duran asked him to tell a small group of us his story. And you grew up in uh, Barrio of El Paso and was a street fighter. Is that fair? Pretty much, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's pretty fair. And, and a, a good one, too. And a, <laughs> <laughs> and you say it in your words. You joined the Air Force. I wish we had time for you to tell Thank your you. story of the town city bully yeah. that you finally won over. Is that yeah. That's, yeah, fair. that's fair? To say. Okay, won over, okay? But your story that was so powerful to me is you were in, the, you say it in your words, you were in, joined the Air Force. I, can't, I, I tell people that I, that I came into the Air Force in 1985 and I joined the Air Force in 1989. All right, think about that just a second. Bren, how long does it take people to buy into a new head football coach? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Uh, the same with our leadership. It takes time, doesn't it, sir? Right, okay. So, but what happened? Tell them, you have to tell them this when, and I don't remember the exact situation about when they were deciding if you were going to stay in yes. or be. Yeah, so I, I, and again, I, I don't mind telling you, I, you know, it took a long time to get the, the, the street part out of me. And uh, that's the, the difference of those four years. And even when I came into the Air Force, I was not a good airman at, at, you know, at the beginning. We don't need the details. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> I could write another book. We, 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 we see it <laughs> yeah, in our mind. So, but, so yeah, there, I came to a very in, uh, important milestone in my career where they used to have set up a board of, of individuals that would make a recommendation to your commander on whether or not to allow you to, to re-enlist when you were on the fence. You know, good airmen could re-enlist at the drop of a hat. We needed them to stay, but if you were... You know, if you had had some issues, you know, they would put this panel together and they would come in and they would make a recommendation. So seven people uh, came to make a recommendation to my commander on whether or not I was going to be allowed to re-enlist. And all seven of them uh, d d recommended to him that I should go home. Including? Including a priest. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. So now keep going with the story, sir. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm sitting in there, and I realized, I, um, man, in a, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be sitting in my mom's couch again. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think I ruined a good thing. I said, I, I, you know, they've, I, I have fantastic friends right here. I like what, what I'm doing. They've paid for some of my, my education already. And I said, and I have not behaved correctly. And I, have, and I have not done what is expected of me. And I have let 
people down and I'm going to let a lot more people down if I'm sitting at my mom's couch in about three or four weeks. And I said, but I, I have no one, no one to blame but myself. And all seven of them said, yeah, he needs, uh, he needs to go home. And my, uh, my commander at the time, you know, stood up and he turned around and looked at me and he grabbed the paperwork and, uh, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, you don't know him the way that I know him. As he said, he has uh, incredible potential and he's worth saving. Mm -hmm. And, and did, what did the priest say? <laughs> I don't know what he said, but yeah, I can, I, to, to let me finish the story off for you. So, uh -huh. so he signs the paperwork to allow me to re-enlist, and he says, come with me. And I was in, my, in a, my full service uniform, like some of these gentlemen are right here. And I remember going into his, into his room, and he, he yelled at me uh, for probably the next 15 minutes. And he was yelling. I'll never forget this, because he was yelling so loud that his spit was landing on my uniform. <laughs> I'll, that's not what we need to do. <laughs> but thank you for but, telling us yeah, that. Yeah, but I told him, I, I promised him, I said that uh, he would never ever regret that decision. And the next day I joined the Air Force. Um, that's second chances, isn't it? Uh, Principal Waters, who's dealing with a student right now aren't you, Bill? Um, sometimes kids do things, uh, General Wren, you've been involved in one of ours, um, that we can't fix. But when it's given a second chance to somebody, and thank God that man saw something in you that you were trying to cover up. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I've never heard it like that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And General Rand, you said last night um, you all uh, have really, there's a hard and fast rule that you all can serve 30 years. Yes, ma'am. Tell it. Sure. Um, so when I came here, General Rice stole. Chief Tapia from me in my last job, and he had four stars at the time, and I had three, so that's kind of how that works. And Kim and I were very disappointed to lose Alice and the Chief. Little did I know that seven months later I was going to come to AETC, to, so it was a great blessing. So um, Kim said to me, we thought we were going to be here through the fall of 2016. So did I. And that was our plan, a three-year assignment. And Kim said to me, you know, we're not going to lose our chief again, right? And I said, I don't know. I mean, he hits 30 years in April of 2015. Mm -hmm. She goes, that isn't going to work. you got to get him to stay. <laughs> and so I was able to actually go to the chief of staff of the Air Force and to chief master sergeant of the Air Force and, and extend Chief Tapia out so he'll be with us till next April. I don't know if now I kind of figured, what the heck, he's, I'm leaving him anyway. But <laughs> for the good of the command, it's fantastic for those 62,000 airmen. And it's really important because there's that continuity. And, and he's helping move the ball down the field, to use a football analogy. And we need him in this command. So if Kim and I leave him and Alice, that's OK. It's good for AETC. But very, very unusual for uh, an enlisted person to serve past 30 years. So that's pretty cool stuff. You figured it out, Chief. It took me a while. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Carol, Carol Ann, can I tell one story, of a leadership story? I'm turning you loose. It, it, because I look in this room, and there are people in authority, school teachers, right? Did I hear principals? Mm-hmm. Raise your hands. Principals and APs. Oh, principals. Pretty powerful folks, pretty powerful folks. So this is my story, Le leadership story about being a good leader. It's about power. Power can be a good thing, can't it? You know, I got to tell you, when you make a uh, colonel in the Air Force, it's, it's pretty heady stuff. When you make general, it's very heady. When you become a four star, you really can get full of yourself. You know, you have an aid major cable who drives you to places and they're rushing to open the door for you. I have a front office. I've got secretaries. I have trip planners. We have enlisted aides at the house. It's heady. It really is. And there's power you can 
you can wield. You know, I can pick up the phone and on occasion I can make things happen just on a phone call, <coughs> just on email. Uh, power can be good, but absolute power can absolutely corrupt. And so here's my story for you. I learned this. It was an epiphany I had, and my wife's the one who taught it to me. When I was a one star, I was stationed at Luke Air Force Base, and we came to San Antonio for a commander's conference. The commander at the time was General Bill Looney. Some of you probably mm -hmm. remember General Looney. I know Michael knows who he is. They're cousins. And we had come in with our command chief at the time. It was Chief Deerduff and his wife, Mags, and Kim and I. And we had a function that night to go to. And I went up to General Looney. And I said, sir, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to skip the function tonight because we have an airman that's hospitalized at Bamsey on the other side of town. And he said, of course. He goes, no sweat. I go, we need to go visit him. And his name was Kevin Close, senior airman Kevin Close, who had just redeployed from Iraq. And the, six, the deployment went fine. He, was, he was, had the world you know, in the palm of his hand. And he was driving from Luke Air Force Base, Phoenix, Arizona, to Southern California to meet his fiance. And on the way there, he got in a head-on car accident, unfortunately, with a drunk driver. And Kevin's leg was amputated right above his left knee. And they sent him to Bamsey to recuperate. And we walked in about three days after surgery. And I'll never forget walking in there, me and Chief Deerduff and, and Kim and Mags. And the look on Kevin's face was one of absolute, you've got to be kidding me. What did I do to deserve these two clowns from coming to see me? <laughs> he didn't feel well. He didn't want to be bothered. And you could tell he was not impressed. As soon as the ladies walk in right behind, he perked up a little bit. Partly because they had all the jerky and the candy and all the goodies for him. And his father was with him, and his dad's name was Kevin Close Sr. And so I go, we won't stay long, and we start visiting. And we just chit-chatted and whatever we talked about, which, frankly, I have no idea. But at about 15, 20 minutes into the conversation, he asks, can I have my picture taken with you? And he was in a wheelchair. Now, you have to realize, since his accident, he had not been vertical since he lost his leg. And I said, you bet, Kevin. Chief, you get on one side, I'll get on the other. And I kind of took a knee so that I could be on his level for the picture. And he said, no, sir, I'm not taking my picture in the wheelchair. So he said, Dad, hand me my crutches. And they put these crutches under his arm, and he hopped up. And he was on, balancing on one leg, and his face immediately turned pale. And sweat immediately kind of started forming and running down his face. I'll never forget it. I thought he was going to be sick. But he gutted it up, and he had that picture taken. And it had all the energy he could have left, and he plopped himself back in the chair, and, whew, and we had our picture. And then I said, it's time to go. I have overstayed our welcome. But before I go, I reached into my pocket. And I walked up to his pop. And I said, hey, Mr. Close, I want to give you something. It's our com the wing coin. I was really proud of that coin. It was, the, it was designed by a guy by the name of Major Troy Gilbert, who about a year later was killed in combat. Who would have known it? But he designed this coin. It had 39 stars around the coin. That was the number of aces that the 56 fighter wing had it in World War II. It had a Roman numeral, 1322. That was the number of airplanes that the 56 fighter wing had destroyed in World War II. It had a Latin quote, cave tenitrum, beware the thunderbolt. And I was explaining it to his dad. And it said, presented by Luke I. That would be me. Luke 1, Luke Air Force Base. And I said, sir, I want to give you this coin. I go, I know Kevin is your son, but he's also part of our family. And I want to thank you for taking care of one of our own. And I gave him the coin. And he looked at it and he said, well, General, thanks. But I think Kevin should get this coin. And I go, that's a party foul. You can't give my coin away. <laughs> I'll give Kevin his own coin. So I reached in, 
and we left. <coughs> After that, we left. And it was pretty quiet driving home. I'll never forget. We get back. It's 1030 at night. We get to our queue room. We're getting ready for bed and start undressing. And Kim looks at me, and she says, honey, you know, until tonight, these are my words. She says a different story, but this is my story, and I'm telling you. <laughs> she said, I never knew tonight, till tonight, how powerful a person you were. Mm. And I looked at her, and I said, wow. Honey, I've been trying to tell you that for 26 years. <laughs> uh -huh. What brought that on? And she was serious. She wasn't kidding. She said, no, I, tonight I realized just how powerful you were. So principles, listen to me. I said, honey, what are you talking about? She said, did you see the look on Kevin's face when you were giving his dad the coin? I said, no, nope, my back was to Kevin. I was talking to the dad. She goes, well, I was watching him. And he was looking at you like the moon and the sun were set on both your shoulders. He had this look of awe. She said, I've never seen anyone look at you like that. She goes, you are one powerful person. And she held up her finger. Don't mess it up. Mm -hmm. I went to bed. I woke up. And for the last 11 years, I've been thinking about that many times. What is power? And this is my conclusion. You don't earn power, folks. It's given to you. You're granted it. You're a caretaker. Principles, you're a caretaker. You will pass this on one day. The power we get is derived from the positions that we get to serve in. We don't earn it. Oftentimes, we don't deserve it. What we get to choose is how are we going to use that power? Are we going to use it properly, effectively? So what I try to encourage our young leaders to do is every morning wake up. Look in the mirror. When you're putting your makeup on or you're shaving your face, commit yourself today. I'm going to try to use this for the good. I'm going to try to be integrity, service, excellence. I'm going to try to take care of the mission, our airmen, our people, and our families. And I tell you, if you live by that creed, you won't have anything to worry about. That power, it won't be intoxicating to you. You won't lose your place. That's my simple, humble advice for all of us. But you got to be mindful of it. Mm -hmm. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Kevin Close, keep him in your thoughts and prayers. <laughs> I don't know where he is today, but I sure have given him a lot of thought over the last 11 years. Thanks, Caroline. OK. Um, I just want to send you guys home. And I know that they're going to be handed off. I'm just a little over, Pistol. These are to your two wives, and I know this isn't oh, much, cool. but it is. Uh, the words on there are why I did that. You two rock. Now, uh, General, the reason you two are getting this, but you particularly, okay. it's the book that my staff, we are doing right now, entitled what, sir? Go ahead, read it out loud. Just yep. listen. Uh-huh. So, so I, <laughs> we're all working on it, aren't we? Yes, sir. You're the best. Thank you, Thank you for taking care of him.